welcome to our course on floor insulation and the broader implications it has on home safety and efficiency. By the end of this course, you'll have a comprehensive understanding of the complexities and importance of floor insulation, empowering you to apply this knowledge effectively in your field. So let's get started. An introduction to suspended timber floors and floor voids. There are as many as 10 million homes with suspended timber floors in the UK. Majority of them were built before 1919 and thus also have solid walls and tend to have a lower EPC rating. So what exactly is the floor void? Well, historically, floor voids served a purpose. Suspended timber floors were an 18th century upgrade from the compact earth floors prevalent in the 17th century England. They enabled buildings to manage ground damp. They enabled the moisture to evaporate from the soil below and dissipate to the environment outside of the house. They were much easier to build on uneven ground and helped the home to adapt to clay-related heave without floor failure. They provided fresh air for interior combustion. They also enabled moisture within the walls to evaporate internally and dissipate out. Let's take a brief look at the history of the void. Suspended timber floor was a dominant construction method up until the mid-20th century, when a timber shortage led to growing use of concrete slab for ground floors. From 1967, the building regulations required concrete oversight to be installed with suspended timber floors. Floor insulation requirement was first introduced in 1995, replacing the previous minimum U-value of 1.2. Today, floor voids contain various modern building services introduced retrospectively. To manage moisture within the floor void, the UK building regulations require concrete oversight with 150mm ventilated gap under the joists and sufficient brick vents for continuous cross ventilation. So what is the floor void? Well, we can think of the void as the area where your floor goes to cry. It's cold, infested, damp, mouldy, and often has standing water with 60 to 95% relative humidity. Here, you can actually see some examples of images that we ourselves have taken from voids. You can see the joist there is completely sodden. There's water, condensation, and multiple types of mold growth. It's just generally not a nice area. And it's important to note that these pictures aren't special. This is a reoccurring theme amongst not all, but a great deal of the voids we have come across. Older homes can lose up to a third of their heat through uninsulated suspended timber floors. However, heat loss from floors is far more complex than just considering the U-value. Air tightness and infiltration through floorboards significantly impacts energy consumption. Drafts make people feel colder at any given temperature due to the temperature difference, or the delta T, between the head and the feet. For instance, if your head is 28 degrees Celsius, but your feet are at 20, you will feel colder. Eliminating that draft can make you feel comfortable at lower temperatures because the air is no longer moving, reducing the so-called wind chill effect. Now if we turn our attention to central heating, by insulating the floor void, we actually help radiators get hotter quicker since you're not having to heat the whole void beneath the house. And using SIBSI's Guide B, we can estimate that a typical house with uninsulated copper pipes below the floor will lose up to 10% of boiler output. Furthermore, research conducted at Leeds Beckett University on underfloor insulation validated that if you insulate your floor in an airtight manner, you can save up to 24% on your energy bills. So we've covered energy, but there's a lot more that happens within the floor void that impacts the house. Let's take a closer look at floor voids, moisture and humidity indoors. Air entering from the floor void brings with it high humidity, bacteria, contaminants, gases and mold spores. So let's start with humidity. What do we know about humidity indoors and how does it connect to these floor voids? Indoor sources of humidity are perceived to be well understood and well accepted and they include things such as the water vapour released during breathing whilst you're sleeping, cooking, showering, washing and drying, dishwashers, pets, plants, all of these processes release water vapour into our indoor environment. However, tests in a climate chamber showed that the real values that these indoor sources actually emitted were two to five times lower than we thought. So where is the indoor humidity coming from? Humidity ingress from the floor void is much less well understood and not always considered. However, infiltration of humid air from the floor can significantly increase the indoor relative humidity. This in turn greatly increases the risk of condensation, damp 
and mold in the property. Air infiltration from the floor voids creates invisible health hazards as fungal spores, microbes and bacteria are transferred into our living space. But where does the moisture in the void come from? Why is it so wet? Well, predominantly it comes from the ground. Just look outside and consider our climate. Most of the time the ground is wet and moisture moves from wetter to drier areas naturally due to hygroscopic movement. Our floor voids are much drier than the outside because they're shielded and heated by the property, creating a constant suction of moisture into this underground void. Other sources include lack of external site drainage, leaks from services both internal and external, external air ingress especially in the summer, and undetected roof leaks that penetrate down. All of these contribute to the 60 to 95% relative humidity found within the floor voids and therefore the resultant damp mold and decay. If you look at this graph, you can see that the sweet spot for timber mold growth, rot and decay lies within the 60 to 95% range that we are seeing inside most of these floor voids. It is well outside of the recommended safe levels of humidity and with 11 to 54% of air infiltration taking place through the suspended floor, this humidity, as well as the bacteria, microbes and mold spores, find their way indoors. The high humidity isn't just a problem when it infiltrates into the living space. It can also affect the timber floor joists themselves, causing mold and rot, which can then result in structural failure. So we keep mentioning bacteria, mold spores, microbes, but what comes from the floor voids today? Well, the air entering from the floor void not only drains heat, but it also carries all kinds of contaminants. Humidity, damp and mould within the moist floor void is mostly hidden, so the occupant health may be significantly affected prior to any visual signs of contaminants. Fungal spores and microbes can be transferred from the floor void into the living space through infiltration. The volatile organic compounds produced by fungi and microbes can seriously affect human health. Air transfer from the contaminated voids into the internal spaces is a significant concern for occupant health. It's important to note with airtight floors, no fungal spore transfer was observed. Floor voids and floor insulation in the retrofit context. We've spoken a great deal about some of the things that can be lurking in the voids, and some would argue, surely adding ventilation will solve all these problems. Unfortunately, that's just not true. In fact, the very opposite is true. Increasing extract ventilation without making the suspended timber floor airtight actually increases the risk of air ingress from the floor void. This is due to a combination of the stack effect and negative pressure. The stack effect is the movement of air in and out of a building caused by the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. Warmer air inside rises and escapes whilst cooler air outside is drawn in. Negative pressure occurs when the air pressure inside a building is lower than that outside. If more air is expelled and brought in, the building will draw air from any available source, most notably from the void. As a result, insulating and improving air tightness without ensuring the ground floor is sealed increases the risk of humidity and contaminant ingress from the floor void, even when adding ventilation. Let's look at the process of insulating suspended timber floors. Traditional manual floor insulation methods are disruptive, expensive and ineffective. Traditional insulation takes up to two weeks to install, often costs over £10,000 per property and generates significant amounts of construction waste. Not only is it hugely disruptive, but it also performs poorly with a very long payback time, over 50 years according to Leeds Beckett University. Traditional vapour open floor insulation does not protect the timber floor from moisture risk. So how do we currently approach floor void moisture and humidity? Some approaches include covering the ground with an impermeable barrier, such as polythene, backfilling with sand, a popular technique in the Netherlands, or replacing the suspended timber floor with solid concrete slabs. None of these are simple or cheap and all have shortcomings. Several studies found mould on both vapour permeable insulation, such as glass wool and open cell spray foam, as well as the adjacent timber joists and the floor within just one year of installation. Will current insulation deal with void humidity and moisture? The answer is yes, but to fully protect the floor structure from humidity, damp and mould, the insulation layer will have to be fully airtight, be vapour impermeable, fully encase all structural timber elements, and be highly insulating. We can see from the graph below that the less humidity the timber is exposed to, the drier it stays, and thus the lower the risk of damp, mould and rot. 
the more airtight the insulation, the less air infiltration gets into the house with the associated microbes and bacteria that we discussed. And the more vapour impermeable the insulation layer, the less water vapour ingress from the void and thus lower relative humidity indoors. So what's the solution? What insulation can achieve this? Well, there's only three options. All of them involve closed cell polyurethane foam. The first two options, though not impossible, are tricky and time consuming, involving fixing rigid insulation to the bottom of existing floor joists. In order to achieve this result, the void needs to be at least six feet in height for space to work. However, with 70% of UK floor voids lower than 450 mils with sleeper walls every six feet, fixing rigid insulation is not practically possible which leaves the third option, spraying closed cell polyurethane foam from below as the only one that is deliverable, especially if applied by remote operated robots. Let's talk about the impact of insulating timber floors with spray foam. In 2016, the National Energy Action did a 10 home study looking at humidity, both within the house and within the void in properties that had QBOT closed cell spray foam insulation. Below is the study of a terraced house in northwest London, where both the indoor and void relative humidity data was collected. What we saw was a 10% humidity drop in many of the rooms. More significantly, the floor void sensors recorded decreases in relative humidity of up to 30% post-installation. As you can see on the graph, this is a substantial decrease in relative humidity. As the indoor temperature remained the same and the temperature in the void dropped from 12 to 9 degrees post-install, it leaves one possible explanation for the lowered relative humidity within the void. The lower void temperature following the floor insulation reduced the evaporation rate from the ground below, thus reducing the overall void relative humidity. To investigate this further, we compared the periods immediately before insulation, after insulation, and a year after installation. The immediate drop in relative humidity post-installation is noted with the red dotted line. A year later, the purple dotted line with average humidity levels decreased by 6% from 63 to 57. Insulating the timber floor with an air and vapour type measure such as closed cell spray foam reduced indoor relative humidity by 6% and maintained that reduction a year after the installation. Let's look at the energy savings associated with indoor insulation. According to a study by Leeds Beckett University, traditional floor insulation fails to deliver the modelled energy savings, with three installations delivering no measurable saving and the others with energy savings below 5%. An earlier study by Leeds Beckett University validated that closed cell spray foam applied consistently below the floor and created an airtight barrier can reduce heat loss from the dwelling by up to 24%. At present, all floor insulation methods score two to four SAT points of EPC improvement and thus may be considered equal measures by some retrofit designers and coordinators. However, Concept Heating, a Bolton-based retrofit contractor, installs hundreds of heat pumps alongside QBOT floor insulation every year. The company monitors energy consumption of its heat pumps, and a clear pattern emerged where heat pumps were installed together with QBOT floor insulation. When the two measures were installed together, it led to an average winter heating bill saving of 30%. So if spray foam and other floor insulation methods result in wildly different energy savings, how does spray foam UFI compare against other energy efficiency measures such as loft insulation or cavity wall insulation? According to the previously quoted study by Leeds Beckett University, top-up loft insulation resulted in even lower energy savings than traditional floor insulation, in all cases providing measured energy savings below 2%. A study by the University of Cambridge analysing over 50,000 households showed that loft insulation saved only 4% of energy immediately after installation, 1.8% a year later, and then no detectable energy savings thereafter. Cavity wall insulation was marginally more effective with an initial energy saving of 7%, dropping to 4 after a year and below 2% thereafter. Some of these disappearing energy savings can be attributed to rebound effect, but a larger proportion are due to various changes and alterations disrupting the insulation, especially in the loft. The critical importance of ventilating floor. Why is ventilation so important? It's all about floor void humidity control. Conditions beneath houses vary wildly, depending on the height of the water table, the ground condition, exposure, the season. 
adequately ventilated and well-maintained floor voids should remain at 60 to 70 percent relative humidity. Without ventilation, humidity will continue rising until the void is saturated. The problems of high moisture content can be alleviated by adding more vent openings to increase the ventilation rate. And it's equally important to remember that aside from humidity control, there is all manner of research, guidance and building regulations that require ventilation in the void. Floor voids, floor insulation and radon. Radon is a colourless and odourless gas that 1,100 lung cancer deaths per year are attributed to in the UK. Radon in the dwelling is drawn from the air in the underfloor space. Applying thermal insulation and increasing building air tightness may result in radon problems. Houses with energy efficient refurbishments had nearly twice as much radon as the non refurbished houses. Well, how do we protect ourselves? By ventilating the crawl space and sealing it off from the living space. Closed cell spray foam is frequently used on the floors to provide an effective radon barrier in buildings. The reduction in radon concentration in a mock house varied from 68% with 6 mL of polyethylene to 98% for spray foam polyurethane. Consequently, closed cell spray foam combined with a well-ventilated void can be the most appropriate radon prevention measure in UK homes. Insulating suspended timber floors and lofts. Does spray foam underfloor insulation affect moisture risk in the same way spray foam in lofts does? The answer is quite simply no. The two insulation measures couldn't be more different when it comes to vapour transfer and moisture risk. Spray foam loft insulation places the structural timber in the cold outside of the insulated envelope, which requires an unobstructed 50 mil of ventilation. Frequently, this necessary ventilated void was not provided, with foam sometimes sprayed directly onto the roof tiles, leading to non-compliant and defective installations with a high risk of failure. Spray foam loft insulation may inadvertently hide potential issues with the roof at an early stage, making leaks less detectable until they are much larger issues. Spray foam loft insulation also makes it harder for surveyors to inspect the roof and confirm if it is in sound condition, leading to some well-publicised cases of mortgages being rejected. Spray foam UFI reduces the moisture risk as well as the damp and mould risk within timber in two ways, as opposed to mineral wool and open cell foam or other vapour open insulation materials. 1. The dew point is well outside of the timber, at the bottom of the insulation layer, preventing interstitial condensation occurring on the wooden elements of the floor. And 2. High humidity built up within the floor void and moisture evaporating from the soil are kept away from the timber by the semi-vapour impermeable insulation. In fact, spray foam UFI lowers the moisture content of the timber floor post-installation. Mineral wool insulation Open cell foam or other vapour open insulation materials do not reduce the moisture, damp and mould risk. Fire risk. Does the spray foam floor insulation increase fire risk? The answer is no. The suspended timber floor is made of timber and as such it is combustible if the house is on fire. Spray foam UFI does not add to that risk or make the floor more flammable or combustible. Sprayable polyurethane foam for underfloor insulation on ground floor is fully compliant with UK fire regulations. Insulating suspended timber floors in practice. Historically, deep timber joists needed to support the floor structure by spanning between structural walls within the house were expensive. To reduce this depth, intermediate supports known as sleeper walls were put into place. Sleeper walls are predominantly six feet apart and quite a few can divide each room below the floor. The majority of properties have sleeper walls made of either solid single leaf bricks, honeycomb walls with gaps for ventilation, or pillars supporting the joist. Most solid sleeper walls have 400 to 600 mil wide openings, often at opposing sides to facilitate cross ventilation. In earlier examples of suspended timber floors, the floor joists were embedded into the external wall. In the early 1900s, this began to change with the floor joist sitting on a dwarf wall besides the external wall. Modern suspended floors are more often suspended from the external walls using hangers. In reality, less than 1% of suspended timber floors that we have surveyed have joists embedded in the walls. So what do these floor voids actually look like? The majority of voids are almost full of rubble, large debris and bricks, with 75% of floor voids between 150 and 600 mil, based on more than 10,000 surveys in the UK. 
current building regs require a minimum of 150 mil gap between the ground and the underside of the floor joist or the underside of the insulation to allow for adequate ventilation. The space beneath the floor contains services often added since the building was first erected, including water pipes, central heating, waste and drainage, gas pipes and electrical cables. So how do we recognise a suspended timber floor? Well, there are a few recognisable telltale signs. The timber floorboards with visible floor nails, brick vents located externally and other traditional structures such as solid walls, chimney breasts or traditional fireplaces. What are some typical issues found in the void? Well, typical defects found in the floor void include infestations such as woodworm, dry rot or wet rot, and high moisture. We operate in a very heavily regulated environment. Everything from fire safety to ventilation, and as such, it's important that we cover every angle for compliance, from BBA accreditation to trust mark and everything in between. So what does the spray foam UFI process entail? The process starts with a technical survey. A technical survey is conducted for each property, including access to the floor void to assess potential risks, such as ventilation compliance, moisture content, infestation, the physical condition of the floor, essentially a full underfloor health check. Following this, we go ahead and schedule in an installation date. The underfloor insulation is delivered remotely within one to two days and the floor void negatively pressurised during and for one hour after the installation. Occupants can remain in the house during the installation. The ground floor should be vacant for up to two hours post-install to ensure all contaminants from the void are ventilated and cleared out. Our information management system also securely stores all technical survey information, installation details, and video recordings of the robot spraying insulation. All of this data, as well as automatically generated compliance documents, can be accessed remotely. This includes digital floor plans, pre-installation building inspection documents, retrofit design documentation, and declaration of conformity. So let's talk about the benefits of spray foam UFI. Benefits include reduced heat loss, improved comfort and energy performance, but also, unlike other measures, improved occupant health and home conditions by reducing air infiltration, reducing water vapour ingress, and warmer, drier timber floors with lowered risk of rot. And finally, let's talk about the sustainability of spray foam. Low cell foam by BASF has a global warming potential of 1% an ozone depletion potential of zero. It is made of petrochemicals. Alternatives such as foam created with soybean, castor oil or recycled plastics are not available in the UK. And the shipping efficiency is high with 250 kilogram barrels insulating three homes. Alternative insulation methods include the use of vapor open materials with higher global warming potential and ozone depletion potential ratings. The sustainability advantages of spray foam during installation include efficient delivery due to no damage or loss during transport, a reduction in waste from material use and lack of offcuts, and minimal disruption. Alternative insulation methods include higher levels of wastage, expense and difficulty with disposal, and high environmental impact from disruptive work. Let's look at the sustainability of spray foam in use. The life cycle of spray foam includes no degradation, an improved timber life, durability, and thermal efficiency. Whereas the life cycle of alternative insulation includes timber degradation, material sagging, and thermal insufficiency due to thermal bridging and gaps. And finally, considering sustainability of spray foam in disposal, spray foam is both recyclable and recoverable in numerous ways. It can be ground and reprocessed into construction materials, chemically recycled, converting to polyols for reuse, and used in energy recovery, as PU waste can be a feedstock for incinerators generating electricity and heat. Thanks for watching. We hoped you learned some valuable insight into the space below homes.